Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Brannigan. Uh, I'm here today to examine your heart, if that's okay. Uh, what's your name? Dara. Dara, nice to meet you, Dara. Uh, Dara, could I get you to pop your t-shirt off, please? Yeah. I'm just going to adjust this bed. I'll get you to lie back on the bed, if you can. So the first thing I'm going to do is have a look at you, uh, let's have a look at you. Just an inspection for the end of the bed, so don't mind me for a minute. First, remember the general observations that apply to any system. Apply these specifically to the cardiology exam. Is the patient well or unwell? Are they awake and alert, drowsy or asleep? Comment on the patient's colour. Comment on whether the patient is overweight, cachectic, fluid overloaded or dehydrated. Is the patient breathing comfortably or are they dyspneic? Look for equipment or devices that are attached to or surrounding the patient. Are there any leads or stickers attached to the patient? Comment on whether these are ECG, telemetry or AED stickers or leads. If there is a telemetry monitor visible, you may comment on what is being displayed. Comment on any cardiac specific medications around the patient, such as glycerol trinitrate spray. Is the patient on oxygen? If so, how is it being delivered and at what flow rate? Note if the patient has an IV line and if receiving any medication or feed intravenously, check the bag and comment on what they are receiving. Look for any implanted subcutaneous cardiac devices, such as an implantable cardioverter defibrillator or a pacemaker. Note the presence of a urinary catheter and any mobility aids. Note the location of the patient. For example, a patient may be on a general ward in a high dependency unit or a coronary care unit. Note any signs around the bed. Finally, note the presence of any additional cardiology signs. The Musset sign is where the widened pulse pressure of aortic insufficiency results in bobbing of the head with each pulse. Mitral facies are rosy cheeks with the surrounding bluish tinge of cyanosis, which is seen in severe mitral stenosis. Okay, so I'll have a look at your hands first of all. Could I just put this pillow under your hands, please? Inspect the tips of the fingers for tar staining, which is seen in heavy smokers. Look for leukonychia or white nails, which can be seen in heart disease. Ask the patient to raise their hands and look across the nail beds for loss of angle. Check for fluctuants of the nail bed. Okay, and could you put your two index fingers together like that, the nails together like that? To perform Shamrat's test, ask the patient to oppose the nails of the index fingers of each hand. Look for light at the nail bed between the two nails. Examine for the stigmata of anemia such as general pallor, palmar crease pallor, delayed capillary refill, coilonychia or spoon-shaped nails. Examine the palms and tendons for palmar or tendon xanthoma, which are signs of hyperlipidemia. Look for stigmata of infective endocarditis, which are rarely seen, but if present will manifest as painless dark and Janeway lesions on the palms or pulps of the fingers, splinter hemorrhages in the nails, or painful red Osler nodes over the finger pulps thinner or hypothenar eminences. All right, I'm just going to check your pulse. That's fine. Measure the patient's pulse for at least 15 seconds or up to 30 seconds and calculate the rate. Note if the rhythm is regular or irregular. Note the character of the waveform or its consistency. And note the volume or amplitude of the pulse, which with experience you will come to recognize as normal, thready or bounding. Okay. Uh, do you have any pain in your shoulder at all? No, I'm just going to hold your arm and lift it up in the air. Okay. So. Check for a collapsing pulse, also known as a water hammer pulse, which is a sign of aortic regurgitation. Check for a radio radial delay and radio femoral delay. Okay, that's fine. I'm just going to have a little look at your eyes then, first of all. The eyes are examined for conjunctival pallor, scleral icterus corneal arcus and xanthalasma. Okay. And can you open your mouth? Look around the patient's mouth and ask them to open and it. Can you stick out your tongue and say ah? Ah. Okay, and now could you take, put your tongue back in and show me the base of your tongue? Note any peripheral or central cyanosis and comment on the patient's dentition. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, have a little look at your neck. I need to support your head for this part of the exam. So if you could lie your head back down there. Okay, and now look over your left shoulder. Fully relax your neck. Next, the jugular venous pulse is assessed. 
It is important to ensure that the sternocleidomastoid muscle is fully relaxed as the internal jugular vein lies beneath this and will not be visible otherwise. The internal jugular vein runs behind sternocleidomastoid, which itself runs between the mastoid process and the sternoclavicular joint. The external jugular is often visible more lateral to sternocleidomastoid. You can ignore this. It is usually possible to see the jugular venous pulsation just above the medial head of the clavicle. Note the complex waveform. When a pulsation is seen, palpate it. A JVP is impalpable unless grossly elevated. If you feel a pulse, you are actually seeing the carotid pulsation. Know the features of a JVP, summarized by the mnemonic voice. Visible, obliterable, impalpable, complex waveform, empties from below and fills from above. Next, check the hepatojugular reflex by pressing into the right upper quadrant while watching for a rise in JVP. It is normal for there to be a transient rise, Persistent elevation indicates right ventricular failure or fluid overload. It is also a good test to confirm the venous nature of a neck pulsation. Okay, you can look straight ahead now. Uh, I'm just going to feel your pulse in your neck, if that's alright. The carotid pulse is easier to feel than the radial pulse, and it's easier to assess character and volume. The examination of the precordium is often the primary focus of an OSCE. If asked to examine a patient's precordium, start your exam with general inspection from the end of the bed and then move on to closer inspection of the patient's chest. During closer inspection, you may more clearly see scars, skeletal abnormalities, implantable cardiac devices, ECG or telemetry stickers, or an apex beat. Palpate first for the apex beat. This is the most inferior lateral point where the pulsation of the heart is palpable. When it is found, identify its anatomical location to determine if it is displaced. It should be located in the fifth left intercostal space on the midclavicular line. If it is impalpable, locate the fifth left intercostal space on the midclavicular line as the first location for auscultation. Feel for thrills, which are palpable murmurs. Next, feel for parasternal heave which is evident in right ventricular hypertrophy. Percussion is not done in the cardiology exam. Okay, Sarah, now I'm going to your the following is the simplest approach to auscultation of the precordium. Using your left hand, palpate the carotid pulse so that systole and diastole are distinguishable. Start with the diaphragm of your stethoscope and listen to the heart in the following sequence. Apex. Tricuspid area, aortic area, pulmonary area, carotid arteries. Change to the bell of your stethoscope and listen to the heart in the same sequence. Apex, tricuspid area, aortic area pulmonary area, carotid arteries. If a murmur is heard, comment on where it is loudest. Where does it radiate to? Is it systolic or diastolic? What grade is it? And describe its intensity, pitch or any other features. So Tara, I need you to do a couple of breathing exercises for me. Uh, I'm gonna get you to take a big breath in and then breathe out, all the way out, and then just hold it with the breath out. Dynamic manoeuvres are performed to accentuate any murmurs that may be present. For mitral regurgitation, without moving the patient, listen with the diaphragm in the axilla with the patient in full expiration. So I'm going to get you to do that again, where you take a breath in, then let it out all the way, and then hold it out. For mitral stenosis, place the bell on the mitral area. Move the patient into the left lateral decubitus position in full expiration. Thank you, you can come back here again. Thank you to catch your breath. So I need to do the same thing again, whenever you're ready. For aortic stenosis, place the diaphragm over the carotids in full expiration. 
Aortic stenosis would be heard loudly in both carotids, unlike carotid bruise. Okay, and catch your breath. And I guess do it one more time, but this time I want you to sit forward. For aortic regurgitation, ask the patient to sit forward and listen over the left lower sternal border with the diaphragm in full expiration. Here is a smoother, more integrated exam where accentuating breathing exercises and dynamic maneuvers are integrated into the exam. Okay. You're not out of breath, are you? No. Okay. All right. So I'll get you to take a breath all the way in and then go all the way out and then just hold it out. And go all the way in and hold it in. Now all the way out and hold it out. All the way in and hold it in. Then go all the way out and hold it out. All the way in and hold it in. All the way out, hold it out. All the way in, hold it in. All the way out, hold it out. And if you could move over to your left side. That's fine, you can breathe. And then the final one then, I get you to sit forward again. And when you're ready, I need to go all the way out and hold it out one more time. With the patient sitting forward, take the opportunity to examine the posterior chest for pulmonary edema, often seen in congestive cardiac failure. First, I'm going to tap around your back. Can I get you to put your arms around yourself as if you're holding <coughs> yourself? Percuss the lung fields. Oscillate the lungs. So now I get to take some deep breaths in and out through your mouth. Congestive cardiac failure usually manifests as late inspiratory fine crackling. Palpate the sacral spine for sacral edema. For the abdominal component of the cardiology exam, reposition the patient lying flat on one pillow. If the patient has shown signs of congestive cardiac failure, do not do this, but explain to the examiner why you are not doing it. They should still be adequately exposed for an abdominal exam. I get to lie down flat there, please. Okay, Dara, can I get you to take some deep breaths? Palpate for the liver and then the spleen. Okay, keep going. Percuss out the liver and measure its span. A normal liver span is 10 to 12 centimeters.
Could you put your index finger here, please? Okay. Okay. Could you put your other index finger there? Perfect. You can take your hands down now. Just going to do the same thing looking for your spleen. Okay. Now can I get you to take this hand here and just put it along your stomach? Yeah, just like that. Assess for a fluid thrill by flicking the patient's flank and, and feeling for transmission of the flick in the other flank. Percussion is used to detect abdominal ascites. First assess for shifting dullness as shown. Remember to percuss from the midline away from you and then roll the patient towards you. Okay, now can you roll towards me? Feel for the abdominal aorta. An aortic aneurysm is pulsatile and expansile, and this may be palpable in a thin patient. Auscultate just above the umbilicus, approximately two centimeters to the left and right of the midline for renal bruise. Okay, great. A brief examination of the legs should include close inspection for scars from harvesting the long saphenous vein for cardiac bypass surgery. Palpation for pitting edema seen in congestive cardiac failure and renal failure. Palpation of the peripheral pulses as peripheral arterial disease will render dorsalis pedis and posterior tibialis impalpable. If there is concern about peripheral arterial disease, complete a full peripheral vascular examination. Okay, that's fine. Just relax them down everything there. Thanks very much. Thank you.